Hi, welcome to video number 12 in Fearless, Exploiting the Promises of God. Today we're going to look at a promise that uh, maybe we don't focus on as much, and there are no small promises of God, but I've tried to not highlight the, the main ones that we usually talk about, uh, such as all things work together for good, although we've certainly appealed to that promise. But the promise we're going to look at uh, today has to do with fulfilling of what's in our hearts. In Proverbs 13, verse 12, we find hope deferred makes the heart sick, but desire fulfilled is a tree of life. Before we get into the promise, I, I just want to uh, review a little bit about Hebrew poetry. Hebrew poetry is different from our poetry, although it is very much about the meaning of words and using words to express things in very powerful ways. They do it in a different way, and it's very beautiful uh, in its own right. And I appreciate, from a teaching perspective, the beauty of Hebrew poetry because um, one of the main uh, factors of Hebrew poetry is what's called parallelism. Parallelism is when a statement is made and then it is made again in a different way, in a parallel way. Now, sometimes it can be um, a reverse parallel to where what's stated in the front in the first statement is stated in the back on the second. Um, there's also antithetic parallelism, which is a contrast, and that's the one that we're looking at uh, today. Jewish poetry, as I said, is, is different from Western poetry uh, in the use of many different things. But what I like about the parallelism is emphasizing something by stating it differently. Um, you, you could take parallelism as in this passage. You could look at the first part, and then you could kind of insert the words after the first statement in other words. So um, if, if we look at the passage, hope deferred makes the heart sick. In other words... Desire fulfilled is a tree of life. Now, this is an antithetic uh, form of poetry or form of parallelism because it juxtaposes things. It, it states something, then it states the opposite of it. So hope and desire are juxtaposed, and hope uh, is the negative in this. Hope deferred is the negative sense, and that makes the heart sick. But desire fulfilled is the tree of life. So the juxtaposition is hope and desire. And in fact, in this parallel, we find hope and desire being the same thing. Now, hope deferred is negative. Hope fulfilled is exciting. It, it's the tree of life. So in the first statement, we're saying hope deferred makes the heart sick. But desire, which is the parallel of hope, is the tree of life, which is the parallel of heart sick. It's the antithetic parallel of heart sick. Um, so, hope and desire in this context are equivalent, and that's where we have, I think, a bit of a challenge, uh, because um, to us, there is a dualism in the concept of desire, and I'll get to that in just a moment, but understand that God is the fulfillment of our hope. We've been talking about that for 12 weeks. We put our hope in God, we put our hope in his promises, and he's the fulfillment of that, and some of that fulfillment we have yet to, to see. But I want us to understand that God is also the fulfillment of our desire. When the focus of our desire is on God, then that's godliness. But when the focus of desire is diverted from God, then evil results. And evil is often, sin is often a shortcut for desire. I desire to be happy, but I desire um, instant gratification. If I go with instant gratification, I often go with evil. And what I've done is I've changed the focus of my desire from righteousness or doing what is good to doing what is available right now or what I believe is a shortcut to get me to uh, what I want. Second Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 11 says, To this end, we also pray for you always that our God may count you worthy of your calling and fulfill every desire for goodness and the work of faith with power. Again, living powerful lives, fearless lives. But you'll notice that he says, fulfill every desire for goodness. 
God's not just the, the God of our hope. He's the God of our desire. He fulfills our desires, and he's promised to do that. And what Paul is telling the brethren at uh, Thessalonica, that I am praying for you uh, that God will look at your calling and fulfill every desire that you have. Now, the caveat is for goodness. And I think among Christians, that should go without saying. I think now Paul adds it in there, but as Christians, that should be our desire, that we hunger and thirst after righteousness. We used to sing a song, haven't sung it in a while, that has the words, Lord, my desire is to be like you. Say the things you say, do the things you do. Oh, let me hear your still voice through all the other noise so that I can be just what you want me to be. It's a good statement of desire. My desire is to be like you. Say the things you say, do the things you do. That's godly desire. So desire in and of itself is not good or bad. In fact, desire is it's part of it. It's a necessity. Because we are not independent beings, because we are dependent beings, we have needs and we have desires. The problem is we often associate desire with evil because often it's used in that context. Now, that's not the only context as we're going to see. But I want you to understand that parallelism also, also gives uh, a commentary. Um, and a commentary is, if, if you go from, if you read in Scripture and go to a commentary, the commentary will try to give you what Scripture is saying in different words. And in the, um, like in this case, in the Proverbs, you're going to have the commentary actually within the context itself. Within exegeting the context, you're going to find the commentary. So in Proverbs uh, chapter 1, verse 8, Hear, my son, your father's instruction, and do not forsake your mother's teaching. So you see the parallelism. Listen to your father's instruction. Don't forsake mother's teaching. So you have hearing is contrasted with not forsaking. Father with mother and instruction with teaching. They're the same thing, but it gives a commentary on what instruction is. It's teaching that comes from mom and dad. And the verse, next verse says, Indeed, they are graceful wreath to your head, and ornaments about your neck. You see the parallelism. The teachings of mother and father are a graceful wreath around your head and ornaments around your neck. So two ways of describing adornment using different words, graceful wreath, adornments, on your head, around your neck. The whole idea of uh, the head being the... Um, the uh, place of prize, et cetera. Now, an antithetic parallel gives a contrast, and the promise that we're looking at today does that. Same, same uh, context of the promise that we're looking at, Proverbs 13, in verse 18 and 19, we find poverty and shame will come to him who neglects discipline, but he who regards reproof will be honored. All right, so you see the contrast. Poverty and shame are going to come to who neglects uh, discipline. But honor comes to him who regards reproof. So we find the concept of discipline and reproof being united. And it's important we understand, and that gives us a great commentary. When we're talking about being disciplined, um, here the writer is saying another way to say that is you're going to be honored if you receive reproof. Now, we may not like the word reproof as well as we like discipline, and discipline's a more generic word, so he's given in this context a commentary. Now, look at verse 19. Desire realized is sweet to the soul, but it is an abomination to fools to depart from evil. You see, this one demands uh, discernment because this is getting e even deeper. The parallelism is there. In fact, the antithetic parallelism is there as we see the word but. Desire realized is sweet to the soul, but it is an abomination to fools to depart from evil. Now, that parallel is not, or that contrast is not as easily understood. It takes some discernment. And this is part of the evidence of the wisdom of the writer is you're going to have to think deeper about this one. And I'm going to leave that one. I, I would, you know, we could go into commentary about that, but I want to leave that one with you because um, those kind of antithetic parallels demand that we do some pondering. 
And I don't want to rob you of that. So if you want to uh, uh, turn to Proverbs 13, verse 18 and 19, figure out what, how he's contrasting those two. And I'll read verse 19 again. Desire realized is sweet to the soul, but it's an abomination to fools to depart from evil. How are those parallel and how are they antithetic? But we're going to move on to our promise. God's going to fulfill our desires. <clears throat> now, just looking at synonyms for desire, we're going to see this dualism. We're going to see the problem that we have. So some synonyms for desire are lust, appetite, craving. Now those carry with them kind of a negative connotation. But if we use some other synonyms, yearning, need, will, you see, that, don't, that doesn't carry the negative connotation. And therein is the dualism. Is desire a good thing? Is it a bad thing? And because of that, and because it's often used in a context of negative things, we'll look at that in a moment, we are divided in our thinking about it. it and sometimes almost guilty or feel guilty if we talk about desire. Well, just listen to the way, just inflecting the word desire. If I were to say to you, Tuesday, that doesn't do anything to you. If I say, desire. See, just the way I have inflected the word brings with it kind of a little chill up your back that, uh, you know, that, that sounds like something that Satan himself would say. And that's part of the problem with the dualism. And the problem with dualism is we're conflicted on the promise of God who says, I will fulfill your desires. In fact, I'm going to fulfill your every desire. The morality of desire is established by its object, what we desire, and its motivation, how consumed we are toward that object. Now, if we hunger and thirst after righteousness, if our desire is for righteousness to the point of obsession, that's a good thing. It's a good obsession. So desire is not good or evil. The context determines that based upon the object of the desire and the motivation or the degree of motivation. Desire simply means a strong feeling of wanting to have something or wishing for something to happen. That in and of itself doesn't say anything evil. Now, if it's a desire to have something evil or a desire for something evil to happen, then that becomes an evil thing. The desire, desire in and of itself is not, but the object of it is and the uh, passion for it is. So let's look at the connotation or the context. Galatians chapter 5. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. And I think it's very possible, in fact, I think it's been done, that we take a desire of the flesh and we set uh, desire against the spirit. And it's not the desire, it's the desire of the flesh, which is in opposition to the spirit. So what happens by, kind of by association in this context, desire becomes an evil thing. Now desire of the flesh is an evil thing because the object is flesh, not spirit. It's not God. Colossians 3, 5. Therefore, therefore Consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil, desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. Again, you have the qualifier, evil. Now, in Galatians 5, we have the qualifier, flesh. In Colossians 3, it is evil. 1 Peter 4 says, beginning of verse 3, For the time already passes sufficient for you to have carried out the desires of the Gentiles, having pursued a course of sensuality, lust, drunkenness, carousing, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. So, the desire of the Gentiles. And we understand what that means. Even though we're Gentiles, what he's using is the Gentiles go after the flesh. They're not filled with the Spirit. Um, they live toward the flesh or toward evil. But in the context, the desire of Gentiles is saying, we're going to live differently than basically non-believers. Now, let's contrast those passages where evil or desire is talked about in its association with evil, with the flesh, even of Gentiles, with a different form of desire. Psalm 51, verse 6, Behold, thou dost desire truth in the innermost being, 
And in the hidden part, thou will make me know wisdom. Here is a description of God's desire. Certainly we would understand God doesn't desire anything evil. And from the context, that's very, very uh, easy to see. He wants truth in the innermost being. He desires that. The desire is good because the object of it is good. Uh, Proverbs 10, 24, what the wicked fears will come upon him and the desire of the righteous will be granted. Proverbs eleven twenty three: the desire of the righteous is only good. Now, Solomon just gave us a commentary on desire. The desire of the righteous is only good, but the expectation of the wicked is wrath, okay? So he's telling us that if we are righteous, if our mind is in the right place, our desire is good. If our desire is good, then God is going to grant it. And it's important we understand that's how we take the dualistic thinking. That's how we take, oh, you know, I, I, I don't want to pray about this because it's a desire and every desire is wrong. No, no, no. Godly desires are godly. That's our passion for God, our passion to be like God, our, our hunger and, and thirsting after righteousness. Romans 10.1, brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them is for their, their salvation, speaking of Israel. 1 Corinthians 14, beginning in verse 1. Pursue love, yet desire earnestly spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. Are spiritual gifts something we should desire? Yes, everything spiritual is something that we should desire. Everything righteous, everything godly. And Solomon said the righteous desires only good things, only godly things. So, guys, when we're talking about desire, we have to equate that with being spiritual people. We have to equate that with... Um, walking in the light. Therefore, our desires in that are to glorify God, to have things that make us godly, to be things that make us godly. John chapter 14, verse 13, whatever you ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. So right before he identifies what love is, and love is obedience to his commandments, again, that's the thirst for righteousness, he says, ask me anything in my name. That's anything that you desire in my name. That's godly desire. That's righteous desire. God grants those things. In fact, the promise is that he grants those things, that he will give us everything having to do with our desire. What the understanding is that desire is a godly, righteous desire. So guys, in the Proverbs 13 passage that we're looking at, hope and desire are parallel. They mean the same thing in that context. So what we desire and what we hope, at least in the context of this passage, are the same thing. That gives desire, that sanctifies desire. And there are times that you feel a strong desire Lord, I want to be more like you. And sometimes we experience that when we've gone through um, a physical desire or a fleshly desire or an evil desire. When we fall off the wagon, so to speak, and we come to ourselves like the prodigal son, we say, you know, God, I've, I've, that's really not who I want to be. I, I, I want to be someone who glorifies you in everything that I say and do. Please restore in me a clean heart. Please uh, please fill in my insecurities and my impatience to where I don't try to take a, uh, a shortcut to doing what is right. I really want to be with you, and I really want to be like you. And he answers those prayers. Now, hope deferred. Hope is never deferred, if you understand it from the way that we're going to look at it. I've just about given up hope for my NFL career ever taking place. When I had to fall and broke my left ankle and my broke, broke left wrist, when, I, uh, when the x-rays had been made in the emergency room, the doctor came into the room and he hung the x-ray uh, up on the light and he said, Mr. Parker, um, I'm sad to have to tell you your NFL days are over. The way you've broken this ankle, um, I mean, it's, it's going to take all the king's horsemen and all the king's men to put this back together again, and you're never going to play in the NFL again. 
For me to say that I ever had a hope of playing in the NFL is just ludicrous. That's often how people use the term hope. They mean wish. They really mean fantasy. I hope that this takes place. I hope that that takes place. I hope I win the lottery. Um, I hope that um, I'm never ever gonna again have to pay taxes, you know, on and on and on. Hope and wish are not the same thing, but hope and desire are. A wish is an unexpected desire. To desire with expectation of obtaining, that is hope. To desire with the expectation of obtaining. To expect with confidence. In fact, in the English language, in a dictionary, trust is a synonym for hope. And they do go together. Um, now, Paul brings them together. He doesn't equate them. These three, faith, belief, trust, hope, and love. They go very, very much hand in hand because true hope is based upon an expectation. Well, what's the expectation based upon? Why would I have any reason to expect I'm going to play in the NFL? I don't. No one's ever suggested to me, Steve, you really need to go out for the NFL. You, you know, you, you need to be a walk-on. Nobody's ever expressed that to me. I have no reason whatsoever. If I look at, if I do a, an analysis of who makes it in the NFL and who doesn't, I'm going to be on the who doesn't. Why might I hope that? Because I'm using the term as wish. Why might I have expectance or an expectation that something would take place? That goes to the promise. If I were promised that I would be in the NFL by someone who had the influence to make that happen, that's a totally different type of hope. That really is hope, and the other is just a wish or a fantasy. So let's go back to the promise. Proverbs 13, 12. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but desire fulfilled is a tree of life. Now, as we've talked about, our hope in the fulfillment of these promises that we've been looking at is based upon our trust, our belief in the one who gave the promise, whether or not he will fulfill the promise. Now, he's never broken one yet, so our hope is really assurance. But in the passage, it says hope deferred. And I think what he's talking about is when we start giving up on hope, when we stop trusting that God is going to come through, and that has to do with what we've talked about, you know, the time frame between uh, promise given and promise realized is time. It's trial, it's temptation, it's all kinds of things that test our hope and our faith. Many have gotten heart sick because their hope seems deferred. Many have lost hope. Now, when they've lost hope, it's not biblical hope because biblical hope is expectation based upon the promise giver, and that's God. And not only has he never defaulted on a promise, he can't default on a promise. We're going to look at a passage that gives us that promise. So, but we know folks who have grown heart sick because their hope seems deferred. What happened was they had an incomplete hope, or they didn't have hope at all. They may have believed. Maybe they hoped. Brothers and sisters, just because you and I obey the gospel doesn't mean we place our hope necessarily in God. It doesn't talk about the quality of our hope because our hope has to hold on in the interim. You see, I can obey the gospel because I have an emotional moment or I have a fleeting moment. Or maybe I've heard a, a sermon on the uh, um, ferocity of hellfire and for that moment I, I want to obey the gospel. I want to be baptized because I don't want to go to hell. I don't, you know, what they've called fire insurance. That doesn't mean I've placed my hope in God. Now, they should go together, but they, they don't always. Then there's the notion of hope against hope. When there's no expectation of fulfillment, he hoped against hope that um, the crops would uh, come forth, and they didn't. He really didn't expect them to, but he hoped against hope. That actually comes from Romans chapter 4, verse 18. In hope against hope, he believed. 
in order that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which had been spoken, so shall your descendants be. Talking about Abraham, he hoped against hope. Now just think about those words. How do you hope against hope? Um, it's an interesting uh, phrase, and it's one that we use in English because Paul used it in Romans uh, 4. And it's become a phrase that in the last two to 300 years has become not uncommon. People say, well, he hoped against hope. If we put it this way, he, in hoping against all hope, he believed. He hoped when there was no hope, basically. But when God gives a promise, there's always hope. Deferred means the time frame has passed. When you defer something, it means that we've put it off. That the time frame for the fruition has come, but it's been put off. That this has been tabled. You know, you, you go to a meeting and... and you um, go to the town council and you say, I would like for this zoning change or whatever. And you go there expecting they're going to make a decision and let you know and you'll leave with the knowledge. But if they table it, that means that you're going to leave with no fulfillment of what you came here for. Your, your, uh, your request has been deferred and that's deflating. But I want you to understand it's not the hope. It's not a biblical hope. It's time. It's the time frame that has been deferred. But time frame can never really be deferred because we don't know the time frame to begin with. Let me back up here. If we put our hope in God's promises because we have faith that he fulfills his promises, then I can't run out. I can't be deferred because I don't know the time frame. He hasn't told me when he will fulfill it, just that he will. So the time frame has been deferred, but my hope is not deferred if I place my hope in God. Not only that, the desires of my heart are not deferred if my desire is, as Solomon said, good. Because the desires of the righteous are good. Patience is being challenged. Time is being, or schedule is being deferred. But it's not really. It is in our minds. But we don't know what the time frame is. Guys, from, the, from before the time... When the earth was made, God knew that in 2020 there would be a worldwide virus. He also knew, before the world was even created, how long it would be a scourge. He knew to a, to a, a minute when the uh, beginning of the end of the coronavirus, or at least of the uh, devastation of it, he knew when that would come about. Now, as we've been waiting on that, as we've been waiting on the revelation of his will or the deliverance or however you want to say it, it's easy for us to grow tired. And I want to suggest to you that the increase in numbers that we're experiencing, even in our part of the state, in our part of the country, has to do with the fact that the schedule's been deferred. Honestly, we were promised or suggested that by the election, we would have um, treatment or at least inoculation against it. And I think many of us set our minds on that. There's been suggestion by the end of the year that there would be, uh, if not a cure, um, there would be an inoculation that we could take to prevent us from getting coronavirus, and it doesn't look like that's going to take place. So what happens is the schedule's been deferred, and so so many people's hope, their expectation, has been deferred, and they've given up. They've kind of given up their patience or you know, what's the use? So, so many have, have just started getting back together, not distancing, not wearing masks, and look what's happened. I think we've gotten tired of it. I think our expectation has been deferred. But you know what? That time frame didn't come from, I hate to say this, credible source. Someone who knew to the day, there's only one credible source, and that's God. So our patience has been tested as the time frame that we expected has been deferred. And many have gotten heart sick, and now our numbers are going up. But in this promise giving, it's very important to God because he understands our hope is based on the promises. 
He understands that the promise is as good as the promiser. So, desire fulfilled is the tree of life. This is what, the tree of life is the basis of life. This is how we, we get the nourishment to stay alive. And to protect all of that, to protect desire, to protect hope, to protect our credib his credibility and promise, God took an oath. He swore a promise. Now, God cannot lie, and he doesn't need to do that. If You know, it, people talk about the days when a handshake was good enough or a man's word was his bond, and that's the way it is with God. But to show us how serious this is to him, and because uh, we have to appeal to a higher name. But God cannot lie, but he swore an oath. And that swearing of oath is what gives the basis for our patience. Hebrews chapter 6. For when God made the promise to Abraham, since he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply you. And thus, having patiently waited, he obtained the promise. For men swear by one greater than themselves, and with them an oath gives a confirmation is an end of every dispute. In the same way, God desiring even more to show to the heirs of the promise the unchangeableness of his purpose interposed with an oath in order that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we may have strong encouragement. We who have fled for refuge in laying hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast, and one which enters into the veil, the very presence of God, where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us, having become a high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So the Hebrew writer is telling us God took an oath so that we could know, even beyond just his word, that he was going to fulfill his promises. I will meet every desire that you have. Solomon identified what kind of desires we have. Good desires, as opposed to evil desires, fleshly desires, desires of the Gentiles. God's going to give that. If your heart follows the heart of God, ask anything in the name of Jesus, and it will be done you. God loves doing that giving us the desire of our heart. When the desire of our heart is righteousness in the name of Jesus. Brothers and sisters, no one likes deferrals. No one likes being put off. No one likes when you're expecting something to be done for there to be an extension. Nobody likes having to wait, and then when you get to the end of the waiting period, the waiting period is extended again. But I want you to understand hope is not being deferred because the hope is on the promise of God. It's our expectation of a time frame. You see, we've never seen God's time frame. We've never seen his time frame for the deliverance from COVID. We haven't seen his time frame for the deliverance from an ungodly nation. But we know it's there. We've all had hope deferred, unfulfilled, when we hoped that people would do things. And I want you to understand that when we have hope deferred, it's when we hope people, their government or the school or my boss or the job or the corporation, when we hope that people will do something. And they let us down. Sometimes the people closest to us, our hope is deferred or our hope is dashed because they don't fulfill their vows. They don't follow through with their promises. We've all experienced that. And what we've seen in that is that we've lost hope, that we've given up on hope. But I want you to understand hope is only as strong as the promiser who gives the promise. Your hope is not being deferred. The fulfillment of your desire is not being deferred. Patience and time are being deferred from our perspective. 
it's almost as saying, hey, it's November and, and we still don't have help with COVID. God's response to that could be, well, who told you that there would be by November? Well, the president said this or someone from the World Health Organization said this or some uh, vaccine producer said this and are they humans? Yes. Do they control everything? No. Do they control everything that they need to control in order to give you that kind of assurance? No. Then time's not being deferred because they made a guess. And a guess is not the same thing as a promise. We confuse time being deferred from our perspective with hope being deferred. And what I want to suggest to you in times like this and in really everything having to do with trial, create a good habit. Because habit will pull you through when hope wavers. You know, I've shared with you before that in my home, you're expected to be at every assembly. You're expected to be at every class. We were expected in my home, the home I was raised in with my parents, my brother, and my sister. We were expected that if there was going to be uh, an activity involving the brethren, that we would be there. It was expected in my home that we would be there early to either help set up or um, just to be able to get ourselves in a, in a mindset. My parents instilled in me a habit of assembly. One of the things that has never occurred in my life is to wake up on a Sunday morning and say, am I going to go today? Um, would this be a good day to go or should I do something else? Or Because a habit was established. Now, let me be honest with you. Are there times that had I not had that habit that I might have gone through that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because sometimes faith wavers. Sometimes hope wavers. Sometimes desire wavers. But that behavioral pattern, I'm telling you, and you've heard this over and over and over, when I have gone, when my heart wasn't in it, I was always blessed to have been there. That's what a habit does. If you develop good habits, what you're going to find is your ability to endure even when your heart begins to grow cold. If we depend on our heart motivation, what if our heart leaves? What if for two or three times in a row our heart says no? What if our heart leaves its passion? What if our heart leaves the promise? What if our heart leaves the hope and it doesn't come back? That's where habits help because Hearts can come and, come and go, but if behavior is consistent, the heart will come back because I, it knows we're doing the right thing. It doesn't feel good about it, but it knows we're doing the right thing. So we keep doing the right thing, and the heart will come back, and it will keep coming back. But if I follow the heart, it can leave and not come back if there is no behavior set to bring it back. Sometimes I'm led by my heart. Sometimes I'm led by my mind. Let me put it another way. My will. That's agape. When I am led by my will, and that's habitual, that's doing the right thing regardless of what my heart says, my heart always lines up in that. So until hope is fulfilled through the promise being fulfilled, Create good habits, create righteous habits, godly habits, so that when your heart begins to falter, when your heart begins to doubt, when your heart begins to grow cold or to pull away, the habits will pull it back, the behaviors will pull it back. I'm gonna do this, and guys, honestly, we do that in our marriages, we do that with our kids. There's all kinds of times that we do things that we really don't wanna do because we've committed ourselves to do it and we've developed a habit of doing it, and we're always blessed when we do that because it keeps our mind and heart and body and all of that and our spirit consistently uh, in line and in direction. Hope has not been deferred. Time has not been deferred because we don't know what the time frame is. Patience is being tested and time 
is God's. It always has been. We submit to his time frame. We submit to his will. We submit to his direction. And we glorify him in the midst. All of your desires he will fulfill in Jesus' name. You take that to the bank and you can live fearlessly knowing that the desires of your heart, the hope that is in your heart, remember that's the parallel here, Hope deferred versus desire fulfilled. God is and will fulfill your desire. And he will not ever defer your hope. Be strong. Be courageous. Be fearless. Exploit the promises of God. And let him bless your life every day regardless of what's going on. Because you can cling to the promises in assurance. Have a great day. Have a great rest of the week. I love you. I look forward to being with you eye to eye, whether it's under a mask or not. Flesh to flesh, being together. I live to be with you. And I live to be with you and the Lord in eternity. See you soon.